There's no people like show people. They smile when they are low. <laughs> Did you miss me? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Lind. There's no business I know, business I know, business I know. Everything about it is appealing. Everything the traffic will allow. Nowhere where you get that happy feeling when you are stealing that extra bow. There's no, I hate this song, stop it. I hate this song, I hate this song. <laughs> it's so show business. <laughs> How the heck are ya? Give yourself a hit, oh my God. Oh, let me take a look at you. Oh my gosh, look at you. It's been a long time since I took my little 20 year sabbatical. <laughs> Oh, the world has changed, hasn't it? I've been reading the papers. I've been looking at new movies. I've been watching all the new shows on television. I've been keeping up on fashion. <laughs> How you doing? What's your name? I'm oh, Jessica. With an attitude. <laughs> Where are you from, Jessica? Oh, great. It's a big field trip for you tonight here to the valley, <laughs> isn't it? It's lovely, Jessica. What do you do in Irvine? I'm over here. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to one of Jerry's kids. <laughs> oh, please, come on. <laughs> I remember when Michael Jackson was black. <laughs> oh, swear to God, I remember when a laptop was something you paid two dollars extra for at a titty bar. <laughs> Not that I ever uh, paid two dollars extra at a titty bar. Not that I've ever been to one. <laughs> Somebody just told me once. <laughs> You can see titties on prime time now. Hell, when I was growing up, the only time you saw titties was when you snuck a peek at a National Geographic magazine in the public library. Y'all remember that? Oh, don't lie. You'd sit there and see that woman with a 50-pound bag of rice, some kid sucking on a titty down to her ankle. And you got a chubby. <laughs> Did you? Didn't you? What's your name? No, I'm talking to my asshole. Who am I talking to? <laughs> Steve, where are you from? Oh, a rich little person. Okay, good. <laughs> nice to see. What do you do for a living, Steve? You're an actor. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. See, we're going to have so much fun. But I mean, I'm telling you, this titty thing, I mean, primetime television, I mean, my God, they show everything. People are eating cockroaches. <laughs> People are sucking on pig testicles. <laughs> They're gnawing on goat nuts. We couldn't do that in the 60s and 70s on TV. We'd been arrested. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine these shows back in the 60s and the 70s? Could you imagine Friday night? Leave it to Beaver at 8. Will and Grace at 8.30, Fear Factor at 9, and Queer Eye for the Straight Guy at 10 o'clock. <laughs> You'd have heard Swanson's dinners drop all over trailer parks. <laughs> Baptist revivals would have come to a screeching halt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, it just seems like only yesterday. I was sitting in the Hollywood Square. <laughs> oh, my God, it's glowing. Uh, hey, Paul. Well, what, what, what the hell, it's Peter Marshall. How you been doing lately, big guy? I'm doing fine, Peter. I'm doing my show, though. <laughs> I know, I know, but I, I just thought it might be fun. If, well, if we could do some old questions from the original Hollywood Squares. Oh, well, y'all want to hear a few of the questions from the original Hollywood Squares? <laughs> uh, 
All right, Peter, hit me with a couple of them. Good. According to the old song, at night, when you're asleep, into your tent I'll creep. Who am I? Oh, the Scoutmaster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, give me another one, Peter. All right, now, Paul, you've come home, okay? Uh-huh. You've got a brown rug. Mm-hmm. You've got brown walls, brown furniture, brown curtains. What does that indicate? Oh, the maid exploded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 that was politically incorrect. <laughs> yes, it was. We got to do that stuff all the time in the set. Nobody cared. <laughs> yeah. Want to hear some more? Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Peter, you got another one? Uh, here you go. Okay. The average child in China learns how to do it at the age of three. Uh-huh. The average child in America never learns. What is it? Oh, how to drive a rickshaw. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a roll, Peter. Give me another one. All right. Uh, uh, Paul, where at any one time will you find one quarter of the Earth's population? Oh, crossing the Rio Grande. Ah, <laughs> uh, ah. Uh, I'm going to leave here tonight, get rammed by a rickshaw, beaten with a pinata, and goosed with a can of plants. <laughs> anybody here? Anybody here from Ohio? Oh, wait a minute, I heard somebody. You're from Ohio? Oh, I'm sorry, it's that bitch from Irvine <laughs> taking over my show. Do you know Ohio at all? Somewhat. <laughs> You ever heard of Mount Vernon, Ohio? That's where I was born. <laughs> I was born in Mount Vernon, Ohio. Yes, I was. Unbelievable. Let me tell you a little bit about me. See, we weren't poor, but we weren't rich either. <laughs> I always dreamed that I was going to be rich and famous. Yeah, we had this mansion in Mount Vernon. And every day after school, I was just a little boy, I'd go over and I'd sit on the front porch steps. Mm -hmm. I used to pretend that I lived there. <laughs> People drive by in their cars, I'd wave. People walk by, I'd point to the pansies. People in Mount Vernon thought I was nuts. When I was just a little boy, I asked my mother what I would be. Would I be pretty? Would I be rich? And that's what she said to me. Case the rock, the rock, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Case the rock, the rock. Five years old, my mother gets sick and they put her in a Catholic hospital. I, I had to learn how to read and write with the nuns. Every afternoon I took naps with the mother superior. <laughs> I spent my formative years sleeping with nuns. Kind of makes you wonder what it does to a guy's psyche later in life, huh? <laughs> 11 years old, I'm stricken with peritonitis. For one year, my mother puts my bed in the dining room right next to the kitchen. Every time I look up, there was my mother with a big tray full of food and a smile on her face. I ate for one year. I weighed 260 pounds. The doctor came over and said, Mrs. Lynn, we're going to have to do something about Paul's weight. I was fat. Goodyear was following me home from school making offers. <laughs> my cereal bowl came with a lifeguard. <laughs> I'd wear my yellow raincoat to school. The kids would yell, taxi. <laughs> my blood type was ragu. <laughs> oh, God. My clothes came in three sizes. Extra large, jumbo, and oh, my God, Martha, it's coming at us. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to say. Take the rock, 
her off. As if things could not get any worse. My father, who was the sheriff of Mount Vernon, Ohio, walked in one evening and sat down at the dinner table and announced that he was giving up being sheriff and that he was going to become a butcher. A what? A butcher. <laughs> a butcher. <laughs> Do you know how embarrassing that is when people ask you what your father does? You know what I said? I said, my father's a cattle surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Every day after school, I'd come home and have to pluck chickens. <laughs> Visualize this, would you please? 13 years old, 260 pounds, covered in feathers, smelling like chicken. You know, there's some people that would pay big bucks for that. <laughs> anyway, I made it to high... Oh, you sick person. <laughs> the actor's going, I can do this. <laughs> I made it to high school. I was still fat. I talked like this. Oh, God. I, my, my teenage love life that didn't exist. I looked like Kate Smith's niece. <laughs> I think I was the first boy in Mount Vernon nominated for homecoming queen at the high school there. Oh, but guess what? I discovered acting. Being fat, I got all the good parts. I played the fat drunks, the fat farting grandfathers. Oh, it was incredible. I was absolutely fabulous. Then off to Northwestern University I went. Oh my God, Northwestern, what an incredible institution. Oh, my classmates were, oh, oh, my God, Cloris Leachman, uh, Patricia Neal, Charlton Haston. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> oh, Chucky, how we loved you. <laughs> it was wonderful. Huh? And, and, and I knew that being fat, I still got the good parts. And I knew that I was either going to be a monk a lunatic, an actor, or a big, fat movie star. Hey, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to say. Hey, Sarah, Sarah, guess what? I got the lead in the Wham Mew College Variety Show. The lead, the starring part. <laughs> and at the very same time, Kay Ballard was starring in a play in downtown Chicago. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna go down and invite her to my show. So I went down to the backstage door and I waited for her to come out. She came out. Excuse me, Miss Ballard. Hi, my name is Paul Lynn, and I'm starring in the Wham U College Variety Show. And I was wondering if maybe you might you know, come see it. Guess what? She came. And she loved me. I was graduating soon, and she went back to New York City and told everybody how fabulous I was. <laughs> so I knew that when I went to New York City, I was going to take Manhattan by storm. <laughs> Guess what happened? My arrival caused apathy to break out all over the Big Apple. <laughs> I had no money. I had no prospects. I was a 260-pound starving artist. <laughs> so I moved into this tenement, this little apartment building in Hell's Kitchen. Other people live there, these other little struggling actors. Emma Jean Coker. <laughs> Wally Cox and Marlon Brando. Oh, God. We all lived in this building, and we were all broke. Oh, God, it was pathetic. I slept during the day. I became the phantom of the kitchen at night. <laughs> I stole food. One night, in the middle of the night, I got up and I snuck. 
down to the communal fridge. I opened up the door, and someone had left a note inside. Pauline, one of these dishes is poison. Take your chances. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I found out that every six weeks, I could give blood and get $5 a pint. <laughs> every six weeks, $5 a pint. <laughs> Fat boy. <laughs> Do you know what happened? With one good meal every six weeks, I started to lose weight. <laughs> little by little by little, I started to look absolutely fabulous. Case. Rust, rust, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Take the rust, the rust, sing it with me, everybody. Take the rust, the rust, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Take the rust, the rust, let me take it out. Take the rust, the <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. What the? What? What? But uh, Paul, I, uh, uh, I, I, I... Oh, will you I just spit it out, beaver face? Now, calm down, Paul. Listen carefully. All right. Why are forest rangers in remote locations ordering goats as standard equipment? Oh, because the sheep are wising up. <laughs> <laughs> You're at the supermarket checking out the clams. You tap the one shell of one clam and it closes tightly. Now, what does this mean? Oh, she's not in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Peter, I'm trying to do my show, okay? Jesus, you're driving me crazy. I think I need a cocktail. <laughs> oh, please, I hear the moans and groans. I have it under control. <laughs> I guess you all have heard the stories. I drank just a little. <laughs> it helps me. <laughs> kind of calms me down. <laughs> oh. That outfit looks better already. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 oh my God. Anybody in here written poetry? That's good. <laughs> I need another drink on that. <laughs> no, I mean, almost everyone's written poetry sometimes in their lives. I mean, most of us like to keep it a secret. Well, tonight, I'm going to introduce to you that shy, uninhibited type that not only writes it, but recites it. Tonight, I'm going to read for you some of my poems for your pleasure, I hope. <laughs> okay, I often, I often go to prison for some of my material. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> and this first poem I'm going to share with you that I wrote is typical it's typical in that day of a convict's life. I, I simply call it going home. <laughs> so long, Martin. Don't forget to write. Gee, I feel giddy and gay just like a groom on his wedding day. <laughs> Pumpkin pie shucks, I just want to cry. Want to know why? I'm going home today. <laughs> <laughs> so long, fellas, I'll miss you. And buck up, Bob, what do you care? There's lots worse things than getting the chair. <laughs> Sure, 
sure I'll be in bars, but not behind them. <laughs> Gee, I feel so good I could just kill somebody. <laughs> You wanna know why? You wanna know why? why? I'm going home today. <laughs> uh. You know, I wrote this next poem for a dear old friend of mine who was in the hospital at the time. Now I'm sure it's not gonna mean as much to you as it does to me. <laughs> Cause they told me he passed away while reading this poem. <laughs> it's called, Cheer Up. <laughs> there are roses in bloom in my hospital room. There's a bird in my window. <laughs> Singing its song. Cheer up, cheer up. You haven't got long. <laughs> Don't sob, my pretty roses, I feel no pain. While fishing in Maine, I was struck by a train. <laughs> the doctor said I was fit as a fiddle. And we all know they lie just a little. Cheer up, cheer up. You haven't got long. <laughs> oh. Oh, God. All right. Oh, stop it, please. <laughs> you know, while I was in college, I studied a course in flower arrangement. <laughs> yeah, I did. <sighs> and I, it gave me the idea for this next poem. It's called Trouble in the Tulip Bed. <laughs> I don't know what to say. A tulip talked to me today. I was trimming the hedge quite near the mountain ledge when lo and behold my blood ran cold. Yes, a tulip screamed at me today. It was my favorite. The one I called Blanche. <laughs> she puckered up her petals and screamed, Avalanche! Yes, a tulip saved my life today. <laughs> now, you may not think this quite so much, because you see, most tulips speak Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I don't particularly like poetry. I'd rather be hooking rugs. <laughs> All right, the last one. I dedicate this poem to all those people who walk in fields of gold, sucking on a cattail, chewing on granola, munching on mushrooms. I dedicate this poem I wrote most of all to that grand old gal, Mother Nature. Oh, Mother Nature. Mother of us all, mother of summer, winter, and fall. Oh, Mother Nature, you make me sick. You've gone and you've ruined our friggin' picnic. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's wonderful. What the, what, what, Peter, I'm trying to work here. All right, Paul. Oh, 
What? Just I, listen. I what? According to the song classic, things aren't as bad as they seem to be if you do what? Oh, put a bag over her head. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, Paul, in the fairy tale Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, uh -huh. what did all the other dwarfs wear that Dopey didn't? Oh, I guess that's why Snow White's baby looks like Dopey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, I can she gets it. <laughs> so you know what I found out? I found out that I could make money writing comedy sketches. Yeah. So one night, I'm performing one of my comedy sketches. Oh, where was I was at? I was at the 357 Club. I was reciting poetry. And in walks Leonard Silliman. You know who Leonard Silliman was? Leonard was producing this new movie called New Faces of 1952. And he was looking for a new face. <laughs> so he chose mine. <laughs> oh, God, they made it into the worst movie you could have ever possibly seen. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I was working. I was pounding the streets. I was going after audition after audition. And then it happened. Bang! My big break. Bye bye, Birdie. On Broadway, <laughs> I played the I played the, the the strict disciplinarian father of a teenage girl. That's a uh, father married to a wife, <laughs> father of a teenage girl. <laughs> it was incredible. In fact, one of the writers and producers realized there was a song in the show that wasn't mine. They said, "You know what? We should give that song to Paul and let him sing it as Harry McAfee." So guess what? <laughs> <laughs> they gave me that song. And when we opened up on Broadway, I tore the house down every single night. Kids, I don't know what's wrong with these kids today. Kids, who can understand anything they say. Kids, they are disobedient, disrespectful oaks. Noisy, lazy, sloppy, crazy, low first. And while we're on the subject, kids, you can talk to talk to your face is blue. Kids, but they still do just what they want to do. Why can't they be like we were? Perfect in every way. What's the matter with kids today? <laughs> kids! You know, I didn't mind the moonlight swims. It was that loop the loop that got me. <laughs> kids! I didn't even know what puberty was until it almost passed it. <laughs> Kids, for the new millennium. Excuse me, you want to pierce what? <laughs> Laugh and grin and dance and sing and morons. While we're on the subject and while we're on the subject. Dick Van Dyke, Cheetah Rivera, Gower Champion. We were, a, we were a huge Broadway sensation. Oh my God, do you know what it's like to be in a hit Broadway show? Do you know what it's like? You get laid. <laughs> Every night. <laughs> you get free booze. Everywhere. <laughs> well, sure I, sure I didn't get nominated for a Tony Award. But I got to sing my song on the Tonys. Yes, I did. And all of a sudden, they're saying, we're going to make a movie. We're going to make a movie. Hooray! We're going to make a movie. <laughs> Guess what's the first thing they did? They fired everybody. Gower Champion, the director. Out the window. Gina Rivera. Out the window. The writers. There were two of them. <laughs> Out the window! The only people left were me and Dick Van Dyke. Oh, God, how I love Dick. <laughs> Van Dyke. <laughs> Every single night after the show, me and Dick, we'd go out and we'd drink till 3, 4 in the morning. Hell, if we were cremated, it would have taken three days to put out the fire. 
Oh, but I had my song. Yes, I did. I had my song. They weren't going to take my song away. And I was going to steal the movie just like I stole the Broadway show. I was going to take Hollywood by storm. Then they introduced me to her. And Margaret. <laughs> Cute, wasn't she? <laughs> but that was about it. <laughs> you know what they did? They went and changed the whole movie. Instead of Bye Bye Birdie, they should have called it Hello and Margaret. <laughs> Do you know why they did it? For the demographic. They'd turn on her little wind machine, blow her skirt up, or what's they, and little boys would sit in cornfields all across Iowa going, waka, 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 waka. <laughs> but guess who liked my song, kids? Those kids! <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure, they pushed me out of the frame every time they turned that little bitch's wind machine on. <laughs> but Hollywood noticed, and I was officially a star. Kids, they are just impossible to control. Kids, with their awful clothes and their rock and roll. Why can't they dance like we did? What's wrong with Sammy K? What's the matter with kids, too? was going to take his university-trained, Broadway-tested craft, and I was going to conquer Tinseltown. <laughs> First thing I did, I got myself an agent named Marty. <laughs> hey, Paul, this is Marty. You're not going to believe it? You're not going to believe it. We got a movie for you, Paul. It's a Disney film. It's called Son of Flubber. Disney, <laughs> son of flubber. <laughs> Paul, it's Marty again. You're not going to believe it. The Doris Day people called. They want you for this film. It's called For Those Who Think Young. You play the part of Uncle Sid. Okay, it's a small part, one scene. Small part, one scene, Uncle Sid. <laughs> Paul. You're not going to believe it, the Doris Day people, they love you. They want you for another one. This time it's called Send Me No Flowers. You're playing the part of a funeral director. It's with Rock Hudson, Tony Randall. Small part, one scene. Small part. Funeral director. Because I love people. <laughs> Paul, you're not going to believe this. They want you for another film. It's a, it's, a, it's a sure hit. It's a summer event movie. Picture this. Frankie Avalon, Annette Funicella, The Beach. It's a sea epic. <laughs> sea epic. Beach blanket bingo. <laughs> Paul, the Doris Day people, they want you again. They're in love with you. They're going to spend a fortune on your wardrobe. It's an incredible film. It's called The Glass Bottom Boat. A fortune on my wardrobe. <laughs> I did drag. <laughs> that was my entire film career in a nutshell. I could have done the good parts. Yes, I could have. They just wouldn't let me. I read for the parts. I didn't get them. I read for Love Story. I read for the Ryan O'Neill role in Love Story. I did. We're on the sound stage. The director says, Paul, yes, sir. You're going to do this with meaning. I said, OK. Give it with all you got. I said, OK. Scene one, take one, death scene. Ally McGraw is laying there on the bed, her little body riddled with leukemia. I'm on my knees. 
With everything in my heart and all the love I could give, I look her in the eye, grab her frail little hand, and I say, love. <laughs> Means never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> I didn't get it. <clears throat> I read for the Dustin Hoffman role in The Graduate. <laughs> so, Mrs. Robinson, you bring me to your home. You give me booze. Are you trying to seduce me? <laughs> uh. I didn't get it. <laughs> I read for deliverance. <laughs> hey, boy, I'm gonna make you squeal like a pig. <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> I read for taxi driver. You looking at me? <laughs> you looking at me? I don't see anybody else around here. I even tried voiceovers. I did. I read for the voice of Satan in The Exorcist. <laughs> Your mother sucks cocks in hell. <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> but I know I could have done the good parts. I know I could have played a romantic lead. It was in me. And tonight, guess what we're going to do? We're going to let me do my audition. I'm going to do that scene. I'm going to prove that I am the Rudolph Valentino movie star stud. <laughs> and you're going to help me. What's your name right there? Right here, you. Hi, Christy. Christy, tonight, you know what I'm going to do here? We are going to recreate the final scene in Titanic. <laughs> do you remember that heart-wrenching thing when Leo's little fingers break off and Kate goes floating off into the water? <laughs> you are going to help me do this tonight, and you're going to come up on the stage with me. Yes, come on, come on, come on. Come on over here. She's so pretty. Christy. Little Christy, come here, Christy. Come on. You're gonna make my dream come true, Christy. And we're gonna let the actor hold the cue cards. Hold on. <laughs> Christy, you stand right here. And Steve, Steve, right, the actor, you stay right there. Now, you, you stay right there. Steve, you're gonna help me, all right? This is gonna be an incredible moment, an incredible scene. Oh, my God, this is gonna be wonderful. <laughs> All right, Steve, come on up here to the stage. These are your cue cards. They're in order. All right, you hold them like this. You may want to hold them to the side. Here, could you hold my microphone for me, too? Thank you. All right, Christy, there you go. <laughs> Give me the microphone, actor. Anyway. <laughs> something ironic about the actor holding the cue cards. <laughs> Christy, yeah. are you ready? Ready. Okay. All right, your, your part's in red, okay? My part's in black, it's got more lines, okay? All right. All right, and now I'm gonna get down on my knees. I feel like I'm with Suzanne Summers. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, are you ready? Ready. Let me have some Titanic dying music. <laughs> scene one, take one, the death scene in Titanic. Take a deep breath and hold it before we go into the water and kick for the surface or the ship will suck you down. Trust me, Rose. I trust you. Turn the cue cards. <laughs> the boats will come back for us, Rose. Hold on just a little bit longer. Thank God for you, Jack. Yeah, thanks, Rose. I love you too, Rose. I'm so cold. Yeah, you are. 
You're gonna get out of this, Rose. You're gonna go on and you're gonna make babies. <laughs> and you're gonna watch them grow and you're gonna die an old lady. <laughs> Warm in your bed, do you understand me? Flip the card there. I can feel my body. It's because it's cold. You can't, what is it? I can't feel my body. You can't feel your body. It's because it's freaking cold in the water, Rose. What do you mean? Listen to me, promise me you'll survive, that you'll never give up, no matter how hopeless. Promise me now, will you promise me that? I promise. Flip the coin. <laughs> never let go. I promise I will never let go, Jack. I'll never let go. Goodbye, Rose. Gurgle, gurgle, give it up for Christy. You are a sweetheart. Thank you, Christy. You're a doll, baby. Thank you, Jack. Give it up for Jack. Jack. No, it's Steve, right? I need another cocktail. Unbelievable. So guess what? I gave up on the movies. And I wandered into primetime television. <laughs> I found out TV was my calling card. I was a natural for the boob, too. Me. That fat little kid huh, who sat on the front porch dreaming he was going to be rich and famous. Huh, I was playing lawyers and doctors and fathers. I was guest starring on just about everything. And then one show magically <laughs> changed everything. <laughs> Actually, I think you're going to find this very amusing. Bewitched! Do you remember that? Oh. Oh. Sammy, Sammy, Sammy! Oh, how I love me some Sammy! Oh, my God. You know, I've been trying to figure out all these years what the hell made that show so darn wonderful. And you know what I figured out? It was this. The tinkle. <laughs> Samantha could be sitting in the kitchen throwing up a rump roast. Tabitha could be upstairs in her bedroom with one or two or three fingers, and you'd hear this. <laughs> and we had an incredible cast. Oh, my God, what a magnificent cast. Oh, I got along with all of them except one. Bats in the belfry. Pigs in a poke. Give me a lesbian before I check. And they did. <laughs> Agnes Marhead. <laughs> Classy as hell, but what a mean dyke. <laughs> Please tell what his name is. He's finally pushed me too far. Oh, get a grand, Dora. <laughs> Please. We played brother and sister and hated each other's guts. I remember one show, we had a wonderful line. I said, and Dara, every time I think of you as a blood relative, I long for transfusion. <laughs> I will not stand here and be insulted by something that's 90% water. I'm 90% alcohol bitch at this point, all right? <laughs> you know what? I just don't have my powers. Yeah, dude. I know, I got him. I don't want scotch. You know what I want? I want myself a margarita. <laughs> okay. Coming from the satellite dish. <laughs> so the stage manager took my booze out, didn't he? I can make it float. <laughs> we spared no expense for this show, folks. Let me tell you something. We put out the big box. <laughs> can make it disappear. <laughs> oh my gosh, look at you. Oh, watch this, hold on, I can tell it, I can tell it. What's your name, you cute little thing there? Yes, you. Hi, Lauren, where are you from? Oh, Jesus, all oh, Irvine larvae all night long. <laughs> you're wearing a little skirt, you're wearing underwear? Look, now the two girls hold hands. This scares me. They're mine, Michael. <laughs> Just 
say that little pinky hole. <laughs> you, you're wearing underwear? Maybe. <laughs> You feel lighter? <laughs> Guess what? It's here. Your underwear. Oh shit, wrong ones. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So sorry. Didn't mean to do that. I gotta find a little couple. Got a little couple right here. You in the purple, the, the striped shirt. You right there. Yeah, stripes. What's your name? Doug. Hi, Doug. Who you here with? Oh, the, all the guys, good. Things have changed in 20 years, haven't they? <laughs> Doug, I'm gonna give you something a little bit later, okay? Give you something to have fun with. This is, a, this is an Uncle Arthur sexual incantation, okay? Could I have some sexy incantation music? Okay. Everybody concentrate with me. It's for you. Practical jokes. My love appalls, spring from my body, and lodge in your box. <laughs> it worked, didn't it? It worked! It worked, did you see that? It worked! Oh my God! You're gonna be fucking funny later. <laughs> oh my, and he's turning the same color as his pink little shirt. Oh my, what the, what? What? Peter! I'm trying to work. What? Well, I know that, but just a couple of more, then we're finished, okay? Okay, what? Paul, in ancient Rome, bakers were required by law to bake something into each loaf of bread. What? Oh, a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you cook, don't you? Of course I cook. You know I cook. That's true. Here we go. You're preparing chicken a la king or chicken Kiev. Okay? Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you should do to the chicken? Oh, tap up behind it with a hammer. <laughs> Peter, I'm over this. You win. You keep disturbing me through the whole show. Where I'm just gonna love 15 year volley. We're just gonna play the Hollywood Squares. Are you ready? Let's go. <laughs> It's the Hollywood Squares, starring Charlie Weaver, Abby Dalton, Wally Cox, Nanette Fabre, Burt Reynolds, Karen Valentine, Rose Marie, Red Fox, and in the center square, Paul Lynn. And now your host, master of the Hollywood Squares, Peter Marshall. Uh, well, thank you very much, and welcome to the show. Hello, stars. Oh, hello, Peter. Never. Paul, uh, are we disturbing your rest? Oh, God, I'm so happy I could just puke. We'll save that until you meet our contestants, okay, though? All right. Now, on my left is Jan, a homemaker from Scranton, Pennsylvania, with six children, five girls, and a boy. Hmm. That poor boy. He's the youngest and the only boy. Tell him I have one suggestion. Drink, kid, you'll need it. And on my right is David, a bartender from New Orleans. Not married? Never married? Oh, a confirmed bachelor. Oh, you're having too much fun to settle down. Oh my God, this crap drives me crazy. Peter, contestant number two is a fruit lip. <laughs> I can tell that already, just look at him spitting there. Oh God, I don't like him. But look at little wifey poo. Hi wifey. I got your zingers for you. <laughs> oh, God, could someone please tell me what the hell Abby Dalton's ever fucking started? Oh, uh, why am I bitching? This is the easiest job in the whole wide world. <laughs> okay, now you've made a complete fool of yourself at the boss's Christmas party. Uh-huh. What do you do? Oh, you apologize to the host and assure him that his wife's hair will grow back real soon. <laughs> Thirteen years of sitting here. Thirteen years of looking at Joan River Snatch. And let me tell you something, she has not had that lifted.
You want stories, I'll give you stories. <laughs> I got a million of them. We used to do the storybook squares, remember, Rosie? They dressed us up as fairy tale characters. Yeah, I did. One week, the producers dressed me up as the Wicked Witch. <laughs> and I think they got back at me for being such a bitch, because in front of all of America, in front of 20 million people, they put two words for all of America to see. Evil Queen! During the War of 1812, Captain Oliver Perry made this famous statement. We have met the enemy and, and what? Oh, they are cute. <laughs> Speaking of cute, I was a prima donna. I was, I left the show. I left the show because I wanted more money. <laughs> the producers wouldn't give it to me. Mm -mm. So I left. Ratings went down. They called. My salary went up. <laughs> Oh, yeah, first day back, they bring me in uh, to the Riviera Hotel. I'm standing there, and this little dyke production assistant comes up to me and says, Mr. Lamb? <laughs> I said, yes. There seems to be a problem. And? There's a problem. You have to share your dressing room with Rocket. At the same time? <laughs> no, they got it in the morning. You have it in the evening. I got let me see this dressing room. Walks me down the hall. Opens up the door. I walk in. I look around. I take one big whiff, and I go, <laughs> This room smells like pussy. <laughs> I think. <laughs> it was a triple scotch night. <laughs> Hell, we were doing the show and nobody was getting any laughs. Rosie wasn't getting laughs. Charlie Weaver wasn't getting laughs. I wasn't getting laughs. I was giving our best stuff. I was given wonderful lines. Paul, you're going down the Santa Monica Freeway and your brakes fail. What's the first thing you should do? And I said, honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> Paul? <laughs> Why do motorcycle men wear leather? Kashafan Rinko fell. <laughs> Come to find out the stupid ass audience booker had booked three busloads of deaf people. <laughs> oh, I was so sauced when I left that night. I remember getting in my car, driving down Sunset, crossing Dahaney. I look up in my rear view mirror, and I see these flashing red lights. <laughs> the motorcycle cop. I thought to myself, oh, shit. <laughs> he gets off his bike, walks around the car, West Hollywood cop. He's <laughs> got his little pad and paper in his hand. Before he can get to my window, I roll mine down and said, excuse me, officer, I'd like a double cheeseburger, an order of fries, and a chocolate shake. <laughs> he was a fan of the show. He gave me a police escort home. Don't you love Hollywood? <laughs> Where else can you get up at noon, drink Bloody Marys by the pool, <laughs> watch porn till four in the afternoon, <laughs> get to the studio at six, <laughs> get your laughs and you're back in the bar at 10 o'clock. 
The producers love me. The crew loves me. My fans love me. I'm the star. Even Peter loves me. <laughs> Paul, if you wanted to know if a plastic surgeon is really qualified, who should you check with? Oh, Joan Rivers. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 it's not Joan Rivers. It's uh, the National Board of Plastic Surgeons. Wait a minute, no, 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 it's not the National. There, it is not the National Board of Plastic Surgeons. It's the AMA. I checked once out of curiosity. <laughs> the American Medical Association, there is no Board of Plastic Surgeons, says Paul. Okay, David, do uh, you agree or disagree? David, what's your answer? You'll go with Paul and the AMA? No, the answer is the National Board of Plastic Surgeons. I'm sorry, David. Circle gets the square. Oh, my God, I could have sworn it was the AMA. <laughs> hey, we're going to be right back with more right here on The Hollywood Squares. Paul. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Peter. Sorry, David. Sorry, I, I bluff sometimes. <laughs> oh, I got the little bastard. <laughs> yeah, I did. Told you I didn't like him. Sure, I probably ruined his trip to Los Angeles, and I probably um, lost him $1,000, but look at little wifey poo over there. Oh, <laughs> I don't love her. Love that outfit. Who shot the couch? <laughs> okay, here we go. What's the difference between a cow poke and a cow hand? Oh, one's a misdemeanor and the other's a felony. <laughs> Oh, God. You know, my female fans love me. They do. They love my sense of style. <laughs> they try to buy my clothes, take them back to the South, and put them on their husbands. <laughs> Imagine a pig farmer in Arkansas wearing this. <laughs> what a tragedy. <laughs> oh, God. You know, I spend a fortune on tops. I gotta have me a good time. I'll be driving down the street. I'll see one in the window. I'll pull over because I gotta have it. I love shopping for tops. <laughs> oh, I don't want anything too fruity. I don't want anything too flashy. I just want something that screams groovy. <laughs> All right, here we go. Diamonds should not be kept with your family jewels. Why? Oh, because they're cold. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call a man that gives you diamonds and pearls? Oh, I call him darling. <laughs> You know, one night, we were doing the squares, and at the, on the same day, we were doing a Dean Martin roast. You remember the Dean Martin roast? Remember? <laughs> I love Dean Martin. I love working on his shows. He had the best booze and craft services. This one night, it was a whole group of us. Dean Martin, Phyllis Diller, Foster Brooks. Rosie, all of us. We done the roast and we get on the get on the plane in Las Vegas to fly back to Burbank. True story. Get on the plane, there's this little girl. Obnoxious little girl. Six years old. Brings new meaning to why some mothers eat their young. <laughs> This little girl's running up and down the aisle before we take off. I'm thinking, oh, shit. <laughs> Plane gets ready to take off. Mother grabs the child, puts her in the seat. I grab a drink. We take off. We're in the air. Seatbelt sight goes off. Up gets this little bitch. <laughs> she gets out of her seat, and she starts running up and down the aisles. She goes up to Dean Martin. 
Goes up to Phyllis Diller, hi, 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 hi. Pulls Rosie's barrette, hi, hi, hi. I was on my 12th scotch and water. <laughs> this teeny tiny frail little hand grabs my shoulder. <laughs> hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> Excuse me, little girl. <laughs> Where's your mother? She says over there. I go, come with me. I grab her by her little hand. Walk over to where her mother's reading one of those god-awful housekeeping magazines. I tap her mother on the shoulder and I say, excuse me. Miss. She goes, yes. I go, is this your little girl? She goes, yes, it is. I said, if you don't take her and put her in that seat, Right next to you, right now, I'm gonna fuck her. Fuck her. You think after 20 years, I'd realize what this shit does to me. <sighs> wow. I always dreamed of being rich and famous. I wanted to be a movie star. Yeah, I did. <sighs> but this silly little show this silly little square gave it all to me. Gave me the house in Beverly Hills with the columns and the steps and the pansies. <laughs> gave me wonderful clothes. Gave me expensive cars. Gave me a swimming pool. So big and enough money to fill it with the best scotch. You think I would have been happy. Nathan Hale. You remember Nathan Hale? He was one of the heroes of the American Revolution. He was hung. Why? Heredity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul. It's, here we go, Paul, for the championship. According to Masters and Johnson, mm -hmm. Uh, what do women do immediately after having sex? Oh, they wake up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, it's Paul Lynn to win the game. Now, listen carefully. Paul, uh, you know this young lady. Mm -hmm. Jaja Gabor recently said she never swims with her face in the water. Why? Oh, because it clogs the drain. <laughs> <laughs> the Hollywood Squares, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I know we got some prizes up here. There it comes. Bring it down. Bring it down. Oh, my God. You don't think we're going to leave here without little presents, do you? Look at this. It's a Rose Bowl float on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Christy. Christy, Christy. What have we got, Peter? Well, we've got rice -roni, the San Francisco tree. It's your favorite. Christy's actually sitting there going. <laughs> Christy, there's your rice aroni. Catch it, girl. All right, let's see. Steve. Peter, what else we got? How about STP, gas treatment? You can use this later when you're reading lines on your next big acting part, Steve. <laughs> Now there was that wonderful gentleman in the pink shirt. What was your name again? <laughs> Doug. Doug. <laughs> Doug. Peter, what else do we got for Doug? And from Dicker and Dicker of Beverly Hills, the latest in for creations. We have no budget, Doug. 
Well, every month you're gonna get another piece of the coat. You, for right now, you can use it as a merkin. <laughs> there you go, look at this. That woman goes, don't touch it. You can take this up now. Did y'all have a good time? Yeah. What a wonderful little audience you have been. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's been so great to see everybody. I must say, she's sitting here in the audience, and I could not be more honored than to have the lovely Miss Rose Marie right here in the audience. There you go, baby. There she is. A knitting ovation. Ah. Rosie saw this. You saw this, Rosie, from the first time we I started working my little show. Oh, the show. <laughs> I'll get you, woman. <laughs> I'll get you. Well, thank you very much. I am very honored to hear that from you. God bless you. I am honored. I am humbled before you, Rosie. Oh, God. Peter, are you still up there? I sure am. It was really good to see you again. My own Paul. Yeah? Take care of yourself. You take care of yourself, too, Peter. I am what I am. I was my own special creation. Give me the look, give me the hook, or the ovation. It was my world that I wanted to have a little pride in my world that I didn't think I had to hide in. Well, now that my song's been sung, my story's been told, we can tell you the truth. I was a flaming queen. <laughs> I was piped into American households, 20 million a week, and America laughed with me. You know, I'm still trying to figure out how I was able to be so bitchy and get so goddamn famous. <laughs> I'd like to think most of all that I made the world a safer place for sissies. <laughs> so for everyone out there that sits on the front porch and dreams of being rich and famous, to all those little girls out there that dreamed of a bag of golf clubs instead of a barbie. <laughs> For all those little boys out there that wanted to play Scarlett O'Hare instead of Red Butler, I say save the sissies. Peter Marshall used to say, Paul in to win the game. Well, you want to know how to win the game? Let me tell you, three steps. Number one, you gotta have fun. <laughs> Number two, you gotta be good to people. I learned a little bit late in life about that. And number three, you got to be yourself. Most people never realized this wasn't an act. This was me. Kids, there's nothing wrong with these kids today. Kids who can understand anything they say. Kids, they are disobedient, disrespectful oats. Noisy, lazy, sloppy, crazy loafers. And while we're on the subject, and while we're on the subject, let me introduce to you my fabulous band. On the drums, the wonderful, talented Mr. Michael Dubin. On bass, Mr. Bottom himself, Mr. Steven Bringleton. On guitar, and I sure all you ladies saw him fitting up here, Mr. Swinger, Mr. G-String, Mr. Brian Reardon. God bless him. I'm sure you've heard this man snort throughout the night. I feel like I'm doing the show with Arnold Zippel. 
the talented, my baby, the most wonderful musical director in the world, Dr. Daniel Gary Busby, right there. Why can't it be like we were perfect in every way? What's the matter with kids? 